Why is Java platform independent? Can you explain it in simple terms? The most unique feature of Java is its platform independence. In most programming languages, source code is compiled into executable code. This code cannot be executed across all platforms. When Java's compiler, Javac, compiles a Java program, it generates an executable file called a class file. A class file contains bytecode. Bytecode is interpreted only by the Java Virtual Machine, or JVM. Since Sun Microsystems makes JVMs available for all platforms, we can execute bytecode on any platform. That's a great explanation. It sounds like the Java Virtual Machine is a crucial part of making Java platform independent. Now let's talk about the GIT compiler. Can you explain what that is and how it works? JIT stands for Just-In-Time Compiler. The JIT compiler is part of the Java Virtual Machine, or JVM, and it's responsible for converting the bytecode into executable code at runtime. It does this when the program is being executed rather than before the program is run. This helps to improve performance, because the JIT compiler can optimize the code for the specific platform it's running on. Second, the JIT compiler only converts the parts of the program that are needed at a given time, rather than the whole program. Candidate, what is bytecode, and how is it different from machine code? When the Java compiler compiles a class, it generates a .class file. This .class file contains a set of instructions called bytecode. Bytecode is a machine-independent language and contains a set of instructions that are only executed by the JVM. The JVM is able to understand these bytecodes. Ask it. Can you explain the difference between method overloading and method overriding in Java? Be sure to... Loading occurs within a single class, whereas overriding occurs between two classes. Overloading does not require inheritance, but overriding does. The return type can be different in overloading, but it must be the same in overriding. Parameters in overloading must be different, but they must be the same in overriding. Overloading achieves static polymorphism, while overriding achieves dynamic polymorphism. Overloading does not allow for hiding, but overriding does allow for hiding. Is what are the main differences between C and Java? 1. Java is platform independent, but C is not. 2. Java has no pointers, but C has pointers. 3. Java does not have operator overloading, but C does. 4. Java has garbage collection, but C does not. 5. Java supports multi-threading, while C does not. 6. Java has no templates, but C does. 7. Java has no global variables, but C does. Can you explain method overriding and give an example? In Java, method overriding is when a subclass defines a method with the same name, the same number of parameters, and the same types of parameters as a method in the superclass. When this happens, the subclass method replaces or overrides the method in the superclass. In other words, when you call the method using an object of the subclass, the subclass method is used instead of the superclass method. I'll write some code that shows how method overriding works. Ready? Here's the code for car. Class car. Public void speed, int speed. System out, print to n. This car is going a speed. And here's the code for sports car. Class sports car extends car. Public void speed, int speed. System out to print to n. This sports car is going speed. When you call the speed bump method using a car object, the car version of the method is called. But when you call the speed method using a sports car object, the sports car version of the method is called. This is because sports car overrides car's version of speed. In other words, the method that's used is determined by the type of the object that calls the method. It's the same name and the same parameters. But because of the inheritance relationship between car and sports car, the method that's called changes depending on the type of object that's calling it. In Java, when a class has two or more methods with the same name but with different arguments, we say that the methods are overloaded. Overloading allows us to achieve static polymorphism in Java. We use method overloading when we want methods to perform similar tasks, but with different inputs or values. When an overloaded method is invoked, Java checks the method name and the number and type of arguments. Based on this information, the compiler knows which method to execute. Word. The compiler decides which method to call at compile time based on the number and type of arguments. This is known as static binding or static polymorphism. Keep in mind that the return type of the methods is not considered part of the method signature. In Java, two methods can have different return types, and the compiler still knows which method to call based on the arguments. However, the return type alone is not enough for the compiler to know which method to call. First, an interface only has abstract methods, while an abstract class can have abstract and concrete methods. 
Second, the methods in an interface are always public, while abstract classes can have methods with different access modifiers. Third, the variables in an interface must be public, static, and final, while the variables in an abstract class can have other access modifiers. And finally, multiple inheritance is implemented using interfaces, not abstract classes. Okay, here goes. This is used in Java to refer to a method's parameters and the current object's variables. It's used when a method needs to refer to something in the current object rather than in the parent class. The super keyword, on the other hand, is used to refer to the parent class and its methods and variables. So super and this are similar, but they refer to different things. It's sort of like this refers to me and super refers to my parent. Are you fine? A class is the basic unit in object-oriented programming. A class defines variables and methods. A class acts as a blueprint or template for objects. A class can contain constructors, which are used to initialize an object. A class can also contain static methods, which are methods that don't require an object to be created in order to call them. Classes are declared using the class keyword. Imagine a class called animal. Inside the class, we could have some variables like name, color, and size. We could also have some methods like make sound and eat. And we could have a constructor that sets the name and color of the animal. See how? Can you explain what an object is in Java and how it differs from a class? Points. An object is an instance of a class. A class defines the type of an object, while an object is a specific instance of that type. Every object has attributes, or state, which define the object's properties. Every object also has behaviors, or methods, which are actions that the object can perform. Objects are sometimes called instances, because they are an instance of a particular class. To create an object, or instantiate, can you explain what a method is in Java and how it's... And can you give an example of a method in a Java program? I'm curious... To Methods in Java have the following components. The name of the method. A list of arguments separated by commas. A return type, which can be a primitive type, a class, or void. A body, which is the code that the method executes when it's called. With all those components... We can build a method that performs a particular task like adding two numbers or printing a message. Would Let's take a method that adds two numbers and returns the result. Here's the full method. Public int add int num1 int num2 int result num1 num2 return result. This method takes two integer arguments and adds them together, then returns the result. This method can be called like this. Int answer add 5, 10. In this case, the method would add 5 and 10 then return the result, 15, to the variable answer. Humor. Okay, I'll play along. Here's my question. Can you explain encapsulation with an example and describe why encapsulation is important in object-oriented programming? Of course. Here's a short, bulleted explanation of encapsulation in Java. Encapsulation is the process of hiding and protecting data inside of an object. It's a key part of object-oriented programming. It allows programmers to create classes that are simple to use and understand without exposing internal data structures or implementation details. Java supports encapsulation using access control modifiers like public, private, and protected. Encapsulation helps keep data safe from misuse or accidental corruption. It allows for better organization and security of your code. One creative example of encapsulation in Java is an ATM machine. The ATM machine has all sorts of internal mechanisms and components, including a printer, a keypad, a display screen, and a money dispenser. All of these are encapsulated in the machine. The user of the machine only needs to know how to input their PIN number, choose an action like withdraw or deposit, and press the buttons. They don't need to know the internal details of how the machine works or how it's built. This is encapsulation in action. Does that make What is the null keyword in Java? And what does it mean when a variable is set to null? Are you enjoying this back and forth, or are you just trying to stump me? The null keyword in Java represents a special value that indicates the absence of a value. When a variable is set to null, it means that the variable does not currently have a value. It's important to know about null because it can cause unexpected behavior in a program if it's not handled correctly. D My apologies, I didn't realize that you wanted all five at once. I can provide a concise one-sentence explanation for each keyword. Ready? Here we go. Try. Used to define a block of code that may throw an exception. Catch. Used to define a block of code that handles exceptions. Throw. Used to throw an exception explicitly. Throws. Used to declare the exceptions a method can throw. Finally. 
used to execute code after a try block, regardless of whether an exception is thrown. How does that sound? Okay, I'll provide a simple example that uses all five keywords together. Ready? Here we go. Try slash Do something that might throw an exception. Catch. Exception E. IT. Handle the exception. Finally, do something after the try block, regardless of the outcome. In this example, we have a try block that may throw an exception. If it does, the catch block will be executed. After the try and catch blocks, the finally block will always be executed. Here's a summary of the finally block in bullet points. Always executes regardless of the outcome of the try block. Great for cleanup tasks, such as closing files or freeing resources. Ensures that critical tasks are completed even in the face of errors. Provides a way to avoid resource leaks by ensuring resources are always released. Improves code readability and maintainability by separating cleanup code from try and catch blocks. Gives you a way to run code that's not affected by an exception. That even a kid could understand. Imagine you're opening a pizza box with the following code. Try or open the pizza box. Catch pizza box exception E. Handle the exception if the pizza box is empty. Finally, close the pizza box even if the box is empty. This example shows how the finally block ensures the pizza box is always closed even if there's no pizza inside. Does that? Here we go. Unchecked exception, checked exception. All the subclasses of runtime exception are called unchecked exception. All subclasses of throwable class except runtime exception are called as checked exceptions. Unchecked exceptions need not be handled at compile time. Checked exceptions need to be handled at compile time. These exceptions arise mostly due to coding mistakes in our program. Form. JVM creates an exception object with the exception name, description, and location. If there is exception handling code, the exception is handled. If there is no exception handling code, the exception is handled by the default handler. The default handler displays information about the exception and terminates the program. A disadvantage of the default exception handler is that the program terminates abruptly.